Good morning, Calvary Stockton. Good to be with you. Uh, I can't wait until when I ask or when I say good morning. I can't wait until you can say good morning back and I could ask you how you're doing in person. Um, but <laughs> but uh, glad to be here. Um, before we get started on the study, I wanted to just touch a little bit on the live stream and explain a little bit more our thought process behind what we're doing, decisions we're making with the live stream. So uh, when thinking about this remote church, we start, or temporary remote church, we start at uh, what are like the core pieces of uh, of what a, of what a church is for us or what we need to get out of like a Sunday morning service for example so first thing is that we want to be able to worship together I think that's extremely important as a body um, second thing is we want um, to be able to listen to God speak through his word together third thing is we want to be able to fellowship together um, the reason for these things is we want to be able to become like-minded with one another through our worship um, we want to be able to grow stronger in the Lord um, with, with one another through us together corporately listening to um, God speak through his word. And then we want to be held accountable um, to each other through our, our fellowship. And so obviously the best way to accomplish all of those things is in person, which is why, uh, you know, even once we get back especially, but remote church will never replace in-person church. But um the next best thing for us while we're in this quarantine or sheltering in place is to be together at our own houses at the same time, at the same place, so to speak, from our own houses, um, but here together, worshiping together, um, reading the word together, fellowshipping with each other after service, which we'll have again today. Um, and so the best way to do that, we think, is, is through the live stream. Um, but with that, uh, it, comes in a little bit of kinks here and there. There's, there's tricks with the live stream. So um, what we want to do is we want to use the resources God provides for us, which he seemed to have provided a live stream that should function correctly, shouldn't break out, should have clear uh, streaming and, and such. Um, however, uh, you know, there's, there's a little kinks in us learning how to do all those things correctly because every little piece of the live stream has to be done correctly in order for there to be no glitches. So a little bit of like warm up time for us to get used to that. Um, but I think particularly for our church is a little bit um, of long suffering involved here because we've been since the start of the um, shelter in place, we've been kind of struggling with live stream breaking in and out and um, struggling to kind of uh, master a, a clean, clear stream here. So there's, there's a bit of that long suffering. Um, we're going to be sensitive to the Lord. If, if we feel like the Lord shuts the door on the live stream, we would be happy to move a different direction as far as, um, posting videos online or, or such. Um, but, uh, for now, I think it feels like God's calling us to, um, like pour into the live stream and work it out through long suffering and patience and try to figure it out so that, um, we can be together, um, on Sunday morning, and then we'll post the videos uh, Sunday night after um, we get them edited and, and able to get them up on our website and on Facebook and such. Um, I think our live stream struggles highlight a greater greater challenges that the church are going to face um, during this time. Um, greater challenges of 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 people who are hurting and reaching a ever-changing culture and uh, helping each other out while each other are struggling with different aspects of this time. Um, and the live stream is kind of just maybe a good picture of how we shouldn't just kind of quit on it, but we should put our, put our heart and soul into it, uh, pour into making it the best that we can make it during this time. Um, society is increasingly going to be online after we recover from all of these events. And um, so what, what we're thinking is we're going to get really good at this online church stuff during this shelter in place. And then when we come back, we'll still be good at what we were good at before with the in-person church stuff. But now we'll have this new skill to be able to reach culture with, with this online church stuff. Again, it's not going to replace... Uh, this online church isn't going to replace uh, in-person church, but I think it'll be a huge asset and a huge part of our outreach moving forward. And so 
as with most things, uh, we want to make take the uh, make the best of a difficult situation. Um, take advantage of this opportunity to learn how to work with all this technology and learn how to make it smooth and functional. Um, so regarding today's live stream, there might be a little bit of delay here and there. There might, you know, if we cut out, we'll get back on as soon as as soon as we possibly can. But we worked hours this week trying to uh, work out the bugs and the kinks. And so we're hoping that um, this week and next week we'll just kind of get better and better at this and um, it'll be a smoother and smoother experience. So I just wanted to touch on that so you kind of knew our heart behind why we're making the decisions we're making. And if you have any questions about any of the technology, um, feel free to reach out to us and um, you know our email's on our website and I'd be happy to talk to you about the live stream or about our philosophy of, of outreach at this time and, and into the future and anything like that you have questions about, happy to talk more. But I just wanted to address that um, first while we're getting used to that before we get into the study. But now, uh, now let's get into the study and we'll start off with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for uh, being sensitive to the position that we're in as a church as well as individually in our lives. Um, some of us uh, being very well provided for um, at this time. Some of us struggling a little bit more um, to uh, get the next paycheck, to be able to support our, our families, to be able to stay healthy. And so in each of our individual situations, we're praying for uh, your hand and guidance and um, the love that we know that you already have. Um, but help us see um, the path forward for us individually. And then as a church, help us um, be there for one another as we're looking for the path forward. Um, so be with us this morning. I pray that you speak to us through your Holy Spirit, um, even in this remote context. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So it, uh, it came to my attention, talking with some people uh, this week, that the study that we're doing perfect love in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John might be a little bit confusing to some. So uh, if you already understand it, awesome. If you don't, I'm just going to break it down a little bit more. Uh, it's confusing because John, the author, we believe he wrote five different books in the Bible, and four of those different books are called John. And so it's a little bit confusing. Uh, the first book is what we went through prior, uh, like we went through with Pastor Adam, and it was prior to me being here, and it was the Gospel of John. And so there's four Gospels in the New Testament. John's the last Gospel in the New Testament. A Gospel just being a book that's covering the story of Jesus' life, primarily, on the earth. His life on the earth, specifically. So that was the Gospel of John. A lot about um, setting up the, when we talk about the Gospel, we're talking about um, how Jesus lived, died, rose from the dead, covers our sins, and now invites us into eternal life. That's the concept of the gospel, different from the gospel books, um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So all these confusing words. Uh, but uh, that, that's the first book, the gospel of John. Then there's three epistles or letters to churches, probably. Um, and these first, second, third John, those are three different books of the Bible, three different letters to churches. So first John is, I think, five chapters. Second John is one chapter. Third John is only one chapter. So that's a little bit confusing as well. Um, John also, uh, we believe, wrote the book of Revelation, um, but we won't be going through that in this series, um, but just so that you kind of have that knowledge. So our series, Perfect Love, is John's three writings to churches, three epistles, first, second, third John. Um, so hopefully that clears it up for a couple questions that I got this week. Um, but uh, regarding our, our passage today, we'll be in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 14, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 14. And the title of our study is Confirmation in Consequence. Confirmation in Consequence. Confirmation, in other words, affirming what we already know to be true, and consequence uh, meaning the result of things that we know. Um, so when, when I was a kid, I had this, uh, for, for a period of time, I had this uh, robot animatronic dog. It was about this big, it was silver. And uh, it was like just when that robot uh, toy technology was kind of 
uh, coming out. And so the dog didn't work like super well, but it like moved its legs trying to walk and then it would like bark and you had like a bone, that, an electric bone that you could feed it and it would like eat it, eat the bone. And then, uh, you know, so it would tell you when it was hungry and it would like go to sleep and things and uh, it would like whine and, and bark a lot. And so it was a lot of fun for a kid playing with the toy, but you could always like turn the toy off when it got annoying. Uh, but then, of course, you know, when I got a real dog, I, you can't just turn a real dog off when it gets annoying. You have to, you have to feed the dog, you have to uh, make sure they have plenty of water, it's a feed on a schedule, you got to make sure that they, you know, go to the bathroom, clean up after the dog, you have to take the dog on walks or play with the dog, and um, sometimes the dog's extraordinarily annoying. And so, uh, you know, it's clear that the real dog has a bigger impact on a child's life than the toy robot dog. <laughs> um, that, that's, I think, where we're getting at here with our faith, is that our real relationship with a real God has significant impact on our lives. Uh, a, a fake relationship, a phony relationship with God doesn't have that kind of impact, or a phony relationship with a fake God, a God that's not real, doesn't have that sort of impact on our lives. But we would expect um, when we have a true relationship with God, and it's a true God, which again, talking back to last week, last week we uh, focused a lot on why we know that it that we have a relationship with a real God. And so because we've kind of established that last week, now we can say that because this relationship is real, then it has consequence for my life. It, it results in a certain way in my life. So our first point for today in verses 3 through 8 is the consequence of faith, of our faith. We could summarize this point by saying our intimate relationship with God defines our actions, love, and witness. Our intimate relationship with God defines our actions, love, and witness. Let's read in verses 3 through 8. Now, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. All right, so in verses 3 through 4, we see the consequence of knowing God. The consequence of our faith is obedience to what God tells us to do. So we have an intimate relationship with God, and because of that, we know that, that He loves us. We know that He's out for our best. We know that He created the world. He set all of the laws up in the world, the laws of nature up in the world. He, he is what is good and defines what is, what is right and what is wrong. So then when God tells us, and He will, if He has not already uh, told you something in your, in your spiritual journey that you think, uh, that can't be right, or that can't be true, or I don't want to listen to that, um, he will. So when God tells us something that, in, through scripture or through our prayer time, that we feel like uh, that can't be true or applied to our lives, or we just want to ignore, we kind of override that thought with the concept that uh, we know God is out for our best, and we know he is truly good. And so if he's telling us to do something, then that is the best path for us no matter what. We know that because of our knowledge, our intimate relationship with God. So then a consequence of us knowing God, a consequence of our faith in God, is that we would be obedient, follow God as he's commanding us to do through scripture and in, in other means, prayer time, um, through, through the community of believers. As God is commanding and directing us, we, uh, we, we are obedient, we follow what he's telling us because we're convinced in this intimate relationship that we have. We, we trust him, like a true trust. We trust our God 
in that intimate relationship and therefore are more than willing to do anything he tells us, even if it seems uh, like something that we wouldn't want to do normally. But because he said it, we're, we're good following God anywhere, following scripture anywhere. This, this point is made uh, both in the positive and in the negative. Positive in verse 3, uh, we know that we know him because we're keeping his commandments. Negative verse 4, that if we don't keep his commandments, then the truth isn't in us. Um, this positive negative is common in scripture to put emphasis behind this, that we're repeating the same thing, and we'll see this all through the chapter and, and through the book, but we're repeating this twice for emphasis so that we know this point really needs to be driven home. Um, to, to put it in the other way, the negative side, if, um, if our knowledge of God results in us becoming like him, we know God and therefore we become more and more like him, then uh, our action proves an intimate relationship with God or the level of intimacy we have in God. In other words, if we find ourselves following God's commandments consistently, then that proves that we have this intimate relationship with God. If we find ourselves running away from God's commandments regularly, then we should, we should evaluate our hearts and think, oh, how intimate am I with God then? Because this is the difference between ourselves being close to God or separating ourselves, pulling ourselves away of our own choice from God, because with God, an intimacy with God is, is lining up with what he's calling us to and what he's speaking to us through the word. And any time that we're kind of shutting off our ears and zoning out and ignoring what God's calling of us or ignoring how he speaks to us through his word, um, anytime we're doing that, we're like pulling ourselves away from that intimacy with God. That leads us to verses five through six, the consequence of perfect love. So in, in verse, the beginning of verse 5 and, and end of verse 6, those who keep his word, God's word, and walk just as he walked, those are the people who are keeping God's commandments, following what God's instructing through Scripture. And this is the biggest one here. It's, it's those who walk as, as what Christ embodied. Christ embodied the word, the Scripture. That language of, of Christ as the word is, is clear through John's writings, the Gospel of John as well as 1 John. Um, it's, it's on purpose because Christ perfectly embodied, lived out, and currently lives out the Word of God, the truth of God, who God is, because He is God. And so for us to walk as Christ walked is for us to embody what Christ embodied, which is this following of God's commandments. So if you are in this category, of, if you're walking as Christ walked and, and following His commandments, uh, then... The love of God is perfected in you. So a couple words here that are important to, for us to dig into. Um, the love of God, and second, uh, abiding in God. Um, so this love of God, does this mean, this is a kind of a huge debate, it, does this mean that uh, God's love is in us? Um, because because of kind of the, the language here is a little bit confusing. So does this mean that God's love is in us, or does this mean that uh, we are loving God, like we love of God? I love God, or is it God's love in me? Um, I think the answer to this uh, debate here is both. <laughs> that, that the love of God is in us, and we are loving God and loving others. And I think that's clear in this passage. Also, very similar language to John 15, when, when Christ is talking about abiding, um, the true vine, us abiding in Christ, and, and Christ abiding in us. I think this is, a, this is kind of a two-way street, and I think it's God's love that we need to be able to love God and to love others. So, what does this perfected love mean that we're talking about here? Um, the first part, perfected, um, very similar to the concept we talked about regarding joy last week. We said, remember, keep that in our back pockets. Well, we're pulling that out of our back pockets now. Um, so, what we talked about about joy last week, it's this perfect is very similar. It's this completing, finishing fulfilling, bringing to an end goal, accomplishing. So it's, it's not the idea that um, it's like without sin, done and done, but it's that you once weren't this and now you're becoming fulfilled. You're now being fulfilled and completed and made whole. It's that I have, your love is now um, becoming what God's love is, this perfected. And then love. Um, this word for love is a very common word for love in the original language uh, used about tons of different types of love, but 
John specifically uses this word for love in two main ways throughout his gospel and throughout these epistles. Um, the first way is uh, about God's love that we can take part in through Christ. God's perfect love that we take part in through through Christ. We get to and do take part in through Christ. The second way John uses this love is false imitations of God's love. So these are, these are ways that love is corrupted and it's like the opposite of Christ and it fails the test of time in, in, in contrast to God's love that stands the test of time and is sacrificial. And so this love that we're talking about here, I think, again, in, in context, is God's love, God's perfect love, established in our hearts, um, being perfected in our hearts so that we can use that to love God and to love others. In verse 7 and 8, we see the consequence of this old and new commandment. It's super confusing old new language here. Um, but uh, this old new commandment, it's one commandment that is both old and new. Um, the answer to what that commandment is, because it's non-specific in these two verses, is love. That, that old, old new commandment, that is love. And we know that from verses 5 and verses 10, implying that into verses 7 and 8. Um, but specifically, it's this concept that we've all heard before, the love of God and the love of others. So we've, we've heard this in the Old Testament, other places in the New Testament from Jesus himself. And here, um, this old new commandment is the love of God and the love of others. Um, my office building at work, which I haven't been to in months, so uh, I guess uh, I believe it's still there, uh, is this really old historical building, and uh, it's been protected by the city of Palo Alto. Uh, it has a ton of character, and uh, it's a little bit tricky for our office because you're not allowed to change things on the building. You have to keep it uh, the way that it is because it's a historical protected landmark. Uh, at least that's how I understand it to be. And so on its own, it's a really great office building, really great place to be in. And, and it's been uh, an office building for, or a great place for businesses for years. It's been a staple in this, a, a main piece of this uh, Palo Alto, downtown Palo Alto history for years and functional for years. But when our company moved in last year, we did a whole bunch of, uh, internal renovations. We couldn't change any of the building itself, but we like added in rooms inside and we added TVs, we added whiteboards, we uh, added uh, like eating food area, kitchen areas, um, AC. Oh man, I, my desk is right between two windows. So I get sun in the morning and sun in the afternoon. So I really enjoy that we have AC in the building. Um, and so uh, you take this building that was there long before us and functional long before us, but it it's has new application to the needs of the business that we have today, a very technologically driven business and age, very different from when the building was, was originally, originally built. Uh, we see a very similar thing here with this old new commandment of love. This old commandment was from the beginning of creation. God uh, built creation under the, under the umbrella of his love and how that defines how creation is supposed to function. Um, furthermore, back in the Old Testament, God establishes this commandment of loving God and loving others. But Christ, it's also a new commandment because Christ now has this continued empowerment and continued application and a new perfection where Christ is building this love and perfecting this love inside of us in distributing it to the world through us now. So it's both got this old historical uh, application or uh, existence where it's been this way forever. It's, it's not like this is brand new, but also there's a, there's a new application and a relevant application every single day of our Christian lives. We experience and live out and are perfected in the love of God. Uh, the, the last point here with this old, new uh, consequence is uh, Christ's inaugurated kingdom. So there's, there's three words that we're very familiar with used here. First one is beginning, second one is truth, and the other one is the light-darkness imagery. Um, it, all of these things to make this very complicated subject very simple for us. So uh, Christ's inaugurated kingdom is how... Um, Christ, when he came to this earth, he, he took what was for the future, this heaven on earth kingdom, 
where God is reigning, and he started ushering it in or bringing it to us now. And so when he came on this earth, he has started establishing his kingdom reign in the hearts of Christians. And to this day, God is, ex is expanding his kingdom and bringing more and more people into his kingdom and identifying people by who has that membership to the kingdom, who, who, who has their residency in the kingdom of God. And that's all believers. That our first identity is not as an American or a citizen of the world. Our first identity is in the kingdom of God. And that's what Christ established starting when he came on this earth, but it's an ongoing establishment of his kingdom in our hearts, and in the future it will be a new heaven on earth that he's establishing that, that full kingdom, full lordship, where he's our king and we're serving him. We have that in part now, and it's being fulfilled to where in the future we'll have that fully. So this is a complicated subject, but it's made really simple with this wording. First, it's from the beginning. Christ always planned to have a kingdom on earth, to have this complete, true, just, loving, um, best for everyone involved kingdom on earth. Um, that's since the beginning of time. Second, this is a true thing. This is not some hypothetical, weird, you know, uh, thing that philosophical thing that we're thinking about, but this is a real kingdom. So to summarize the this, this first point, the consequence of faith, our intimate relationship with God defines our actions, love, and witness. Our intimate relationship with God defines our actions, love, and witness. Actions being our obedience to his commandments, love being what he's perfecting in us, and love of others, love of God, love of others, and witness being this uh, kingdom of God that uh, he's bringing about in our hearts. So that brings us to uh, point number two, the application of consequence. So, so now that we're being changed by our faith and our relationship to God, how do we apply that? We can summarize this point by saying the love of God extends to those around us no matter what stage of spiritual development we are in. The love of God extends to those around us no matter what stage of spiritual development we are in. Let's read in verses 9 through 14. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness, and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. So, in verse 9 through 11, we see uh, love to our neighbors. This light-darkness imagery, again, is, is the idea is it's making these, these things as clear to us as day and night, black and white, that, that type of clearness. Um, that's why the light-darkness imagery is here. So um, our love shows what kind of light or darkness we're already in. And, and so I want you to not think about any, anybody else right now besides yourself. This is just kind of an inward reflecting. So as you're, um, uh, as you're kind of thinking, prayerfully considering how much love that you show and demonstrate and feel toward God and toward others, you, you look at that love and that kind of shows the amount of light or darkness we're already in. In other words, light and darkness, remember, is the amount that we're together, intimate with God, following his commandments, a part of his kingdom, or how much we're pulling ourselves away from God, darkness, how much we're separating ourselves from God and kind of going on our own path. That's, that's the darkness, is like our own path away from God, and the light is us walking side by side with God. So the love that we're showing toward God himself and toward others, that shows how much light and dark we are already in, how much we're tight, close, intimate with God, or how much we're following on our own path. Furthermore, uh, the amount of love that we show, like in this next week, 
contributes to where we stand even further. As we demonstrate love toward God, and as we demonstrate love towards others, we walk toward God, walk into his kingdom more and more, and, and into his perfect love more and more, and that, that love is perfected in us more and more. Um, as we actively uh, avoid love or, or don't think about love or don't love others, don't love God as much, don't love others as much, or demonstrate that love as much, we're choosing to walk further and further from from God and from that intimate relationship. So our love to our neighbor um, kind of helps us identify where we stand currently and as well as what direction we're walking in toward the future. Um, also, just to note here, don't be tripped up by the masculine language in these verses and the ones we're about to read. Um, it applies to all Christians, so you could think about brother here as, as neighbor, for instance. So in verses 12 through 14, we see the love in us all. Uh, there's three categories here that apply to spiritual development. Uh, first is little children. Second is fathers. Third is young men. Three different categories. This applies to our spiritual development or our spiritual maturity. Um, there maybe is some correlation to age, um, but it's really not about you know how old you are, whether you're a father or, or a child. It's not about that. It's about um, or how many years you've been a Christian or such. It's about spiritual maturity, uh, being a child as a Christian or more of a father and Christian or as a, a young man. And we'll kind of walk through that. Um, so first category that we, we see in verse 12 and the uh, end of verse 13 is the category of little children. Um, these are Christians who are young in their faith, like baby Christians, uh, brand new. There's two different words used here to uh, describe little children. Um, the first word in verse 12 is a kind of kind address, like a teacher would be speaking to their student, the very kindness. It emphasizes a community nature of the father-son relationship or of like a community nature of the parent-child relationship. So this is very kind, very like teacher-to-student type um, communication. And it says, your sins are forgiven. Um, your sins are forgiven, again, from this like community teacher kind address. Your sins are forgiven for the glory of God specifically. Um, you, your life is now Christ. If you're, if you're a young Christian, this is something that's, that's first on your mind, that you've experienced the weight lifted off your shoulders because your sins are now, are now gone, that nothing you've done or will do will, will be held against you because Christ has covered that. That weight is gone. You have taken your life and you've handed it to Christ, and Christ has died on the cross with that life, and rose again, conquering that sinful life, that failure life. Now, you walk in Christ's life. Christ's perfect life is now yours. That's what you've received. So, so now, your entire life is defined, like your identity is in walking Christ's life, in his place, as if Christ was walking through you. That's who you are at the core that's, that's your intimacy with God, is you're now living as if you're living Christ's life. The second word for little children in verse 13 uh, is like little child, kind of uh, immature Christian type of word. Um, there is like a connotation of like a, the, the discipline nature between a father-son relationship or between a parent-child relationship, this discipline of a, like an immature Christian, like a little child. Um, and it says, you have known the Father. Known the Father. Emphasizing this intimate relationship with you have, that you have with God. That has consequence. That's what we've been talking about. This intimate relationship that you now have with God. Because you're a Christian. Becoming a Christian is trusting Jesus to save your life. And be coming into this intimate relationship with God. And now that you have this intimate relationship with God, it has consequence. It will change your life. Your life won't be the same. You don't immediately become perfect. But Christ forgives all of your sin immediately. And then immediately, your relationship with God starts working and developing God's love in you. And God's change in you. And working obedience in you. And so this intimate relationship that you now have with God it has consequence. It, it changes your life. Um, it, it's common knowledge to talk about the father-son relationship in our culture and how much impact a father has on a son. You think of 
cultural, um, cultural expressions of that, like the song Cats in the Cradle, where the whole song is uh, this little boy looking up to his dad, but his dad's like an absent father. And so the little boy is saying the whole time, I want to be just like you when I grow up. Um, that's all I want to be is just like you. And, and of course, the son grows up and he becomes just like his father, absent towards his father, just as his father is absent towards him. And so this impact of father-son is, is, is something that uh, we kind of all know and, and it's popular in our culture. The difference here is that uh, our, our God is a perfect father. And so when you're a young Christian, you're looking up at, at God like, like you want to be just like him. And you're watching God's every move, just like the little boy in the song watches his dad's every move. You're watching God's every move, but God's a perfect father. He's not absent. He's very present. He's very intimate with you, established here. And you're learning everything from him, learning how to, to be perfect as he's perfect, learning how to adopt his life into your own life, learning how to gain his wisdom in your own wisdom, learning how to act as if he would act in your own situation. And this is the, just the amazing work that God's doing in these young Christians, baby Christians, uh, many of us here today, baby Christians. This is what God's doing in our lives. Uh, second category here is fathers in the first part of verse 13 and the second part of, uh, or first part of verse 14 as well. Uh, these fathers are like more mature Christians, stable Christians, Christians who are encouraging to others, Christians who father other Christians. Um, this word for father here is a very common word for father, no particular um, focus there. Um, but what is said about to the fathers is repeated twice. You have known him who is from the beginning. That's repeated twice for emphasis. You have known him who is from the beginning. This, this idea of knowledge, intimacy, and from the beginning, this mature, experienced faith you have this uh, ongoing historical knowledge of God and uh, in, in this intimacy with him through this knowledge. Very similar language to the old new commandment. Um, you have this, this love that you learned when you were a baby Christian, but then you walked every single day of your Christian life and became more and more um, consumed by God's love. And that love started bearing fruit toward other Christians. As you've abided in Christ day by day throughout your, your Christian walk now, all that love and all that abiding and all that intimacy relationship with God has bore fruit to other Christians and other Christians benefit from all of that throughout all of your time working, working with God. You find, uh, you often find these experienced Christians in, in local church settings um, when I was down south, I had an older pastor who uh, was one of those people you always wanted to, to listen to and, and uh, learn from. And um, he was so simple to understand when he talked, but everything was so profound that you, want, you wanted to hear about it. It was like simple and profound at the same time. And he could communicate in a way that uh, you like really resonated with, but at the same time, you felt like you could never communicate that well, <laughs> of that, that concept that well. Um, and so, uh, you know, he, it, it felt like he had seen everything and that no experiences surprised him and, and that you could bring up any subject with him. And, and he had a very easy, simple way to move forward through that problem and uh, something that just made it all clear in your head. Those are the, those are the experienced fathering Christians here in this category that, that we find that help the church um, learn and grow from the fruit that they're bearing, from the amount of time that they've spent loving God, loving others, abiding in Christ, living this out day by day. And this old commandment of love has a new application every day and a new life every day from Christ and the Holy Spirit working through them. The last category is young men in verses 13 and 14, the middle of those verses. Um, these are Christians who are more developed um, they're strong in spiritual warfare, so uh, they're not young Christians, baby Christians. They haven't just become Christians. They've got some experience, but they're not quite at the fathering other Christian stage where they're uh, fathering other Christians and bearing that type of experienced fruit. Um, so the word for young men here emphasizes servanthood, this humble, willing-to-work-hard type attitude. Um, so it says, you have overcome the wicked one. This is uh, mentioned twice, the spiritual warfare is common 
and uh, and uh, something expected for these young men. You are strong. You withstand that. Um, the word of God abides in you. That you're using the the word as your sword to to fight through life and work through struggles. Um, you've experienced the love of God inside you as as this young Christian. You've practiced walking in the light as God is in the light, walking away from darkness and in the light. That's what these like. Uh, these strong young men category of Christians are. When I first started pastoring at Calvary Chapel La Mirada down south, uh, most of the congregation um, and most of the pastoral staff were older guys, kind of the more fathering Christian category that we were talking about. And uh, the concept of younger pastors was still a little bit foreign to Calvary Chapel at the time. It was it was kind of a brand new thing. And so uh, there was a couple of us younger guys who weren't baby Christians. We had experienced something. We, we had a little bit of weather on us, um, but we weren't quite those fathering Christians either. And, and we were able to come into the church and like attack different problems and, and uh, take spiritual battles that the church was facing head on. And we had like this energy and excitement and like the broad eyes that you need to, to feel like the church can, can go after any problem and that nothing could stop God's church. Like that kind of attitude and gusto. And this is what we see in this category of like young young men Christians. And, and again, don't get tripped up by the, the masculine language. It's, it's all Christians, male and female, in this kind of category of, of young men Christians who are, are more developed and, and have this strong spiritual warfare like fight in them. Um, and, and so you can see through all these examples why we need all different types of Christians in our church body. Because we can learn from, from every single one of these categories. We can learn from the little children category of, of, of their identity. Our identity is in Christ. We are Christ now. We're living Christ's life out, and, and this intimate relationship has consequence from us. We can learn from the fathering Christians as their fruit is, is, is uh, being born, and we're being able to benefit from all the things that they've experienced in the old and, and new applied love of God. And these young men, we can kind of go arm in arm as Christians with these young men category. And, and fight these spiritual battles and, and fight forward with what uh, God has for us. So all great examples of, of Christians in the church. And, and wherever you stand, um, embrace that and embrace your peace in the church and embrace how you can help others around you and learn from others in the church around you and be encouraged. So to summarize um, for today, the confirmation in consequence. Com- this is confirming our faith in the consequence that our faith has in our lives or the result that our faith has in our lives. To summarize this, we can say we can be confident in our intimate relationship with God by how it transforms and shapes our life. We can be confident in the intimate relationship we have with God by how it transforms and shapes our lives. Amen. Right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the encouragement to... Uh, understand our faith and our relationship and our intimacy with you in the context of how uh, we follow what you ask us to do and how we love as you loved and how we extend the kingdom of God to those around us um, at, in your place. That, that uh, Christ left this earth so that the Holy Spirit can work in us. And man, this is hard sometimes, Lord, to embrace where you have us in our maturity, in our Christian walk. Um, But we pray that you would do the miraculous there, that the Holy Spirit would become clear to us and speak to us, that we would be encouraged with the Christians around us to press forward toward what you're calling for us, abiding in you, walking in your light, walking toward you, not away from you, not in that darkness. We pray for your your love and grace to be apparent to us. We trust that it is there, that it's true, that it's real. It's not fake, but we pray that it's apparent to us, clear to us, that we can see it and feel it, and that would encourage us together this morning. We pray for um, everybody who's affected at this time. We pray for those who have uh, lost loved ones recently, that they would have your comfort um, in this time of loss. We pray for those who are struggling <clears throat> financially or relationally or with anxiety uh, during uh, the shelter-in-place pandemic stuff. Um, 
you'd be with them, comforting their souls so deeply that only you can reach that part of their, their mind, that part of their thoughts and feelings. We pray for our church that you would keep us strong together against anything that would come against us in this time, any sort of division, any sort of confusion, any sort of discouragement and because of technology, because of distance, because of what someone has said, anything. You would protect us from all of that attack. You would um, help us show that love that you have for us to everyone around us. That we would love our neighbor as you love us and as you love our neighbor. And we'd find this true joy in this intimacy we have with you. Pray for anyone who's not a Christian uh, watching today. I pray that you would capture their heart make yourself known to them, that they would see you, trust you with their life, just ask you for forgiveness and ask you to take on your life and your identity and be a part of your kingdom. Join us, have them join us, I pray. Pray for anybody here who uh, is um, convicted by what you've spoken to us this morning and embracing uh, walking in the light with you and seeing the consequence of their true faith being lived out daily, even in uh, their own house in quarantine, if that's the case, even with their own spouse and kids and family and uh, extended family and friends and neighbors, literal neighbors next door. Pray that you help them work out the details here and help them reach out to uh, other Christians at the church to be encouraged. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So uh, I want to remind you, if, if you are interested in trusting Jesus for the first time, maybe you did here this morning, please reach out to us, info at calvarystockton.com. I would love to chat with you and pray with you. Um, if you uh, would like specific prayer about what we talked about this morning or anything else, you can use the prayer card on our website, or you can reach out to us at info at calvarystockton.com, either way. Um, but right now we're going to head over to our fellowship on the on the Google Meet. So go onto the website, uh, click on the link on the front page of the website for the Google Meet, or um, we'll put up the card so you can type that in your browser as well if you would like. And we'll see you there for fellowship um, and for like 30 minutes of fellowship. God bless.